Hey everyone, it's Hugo Ban Anderson here. I am super excited to be here today with Simon Willison uh, to be talking about uh, the Zen of Python, Unix, LLMs, and how Python, data, uh, generative AI, all of these things have been developing to the, the place we are today and to think about um, what the future, uh, the bright future may, may bring. Um, if you are able to introduce yourself in the chat, it'd be great to know uh, where where you're calling in from, where you're watching from, what type of work you do, why you're interested in, in these types of things. Um, if it's if you're a hobbyist or you're a machine learning or AI engineer, any of these types of things, um, let us know in the chat and we'll get started in a couple of minutes. It's also super exciting to already see um, 70 people watching now. Um, and if you like this type of thing, uh, tell your friends and get them to join as well. All right, everyone, it's Hugo Ban Anderson here. Um, uh, we're about to start a fireside chat for February with uh, Simon Willison to talk all about Python, Unix, LLMs. I'm particularly excited for a number of reasons, but uh, Simon is someone who um, has been active in so many different parts of the Python, Python ecosystem from the web framework side, being a co-creator of, of Django, um, to all the generative AI and LLM stuff that we're seeing at the moment. Uh, to the data side with his wonderful data set project, uh, among other things. And these are things we'll, we'll, we'll get into. Um, but if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself in the chat, uh, we'll get started in less than 60 seconds. I've got my hourglass timing. And it's just wonderful to see people from all around the place, from New England, from uh, uh, California, from Dallas. It's it's USA centric so far today. Um, Portland. Oh yeah, Jonathan Whitaker. Hey mate. Um, Katie Johnson in Seattle. Great to see you, Katie. Um, Rohit from who's an AI engineer at Ford. Uh, people working in SaaS SaaS tools. Um, people who are beginners as well. Product managers. To learn about LLMs, so that's that's just super exciting. Um, all right, well, I'm I'm too excited to not get started now. So Simon, why don't we turn our cameras on and and jump in? Yeah, let's do this. Hey Hugo, it's great to be here. Hey mate, how are you? I'm pretty good. Yeah, fantastic. Great, great to see you. And your on the west coast of the United States of America? I am. I'm half moon bay, so I'm half an hour south of San Francisco. Great. Is that is that close to Santa Cruz or uh yes, on the halfway, way? It's a bit halfway further. from San Francisco to Santa Cruz, basically. Cool. On the on the stretch um, of Pacific Coast Highway. Beautiful part of Highway One's one of my favorite drives in the world. Um yeah, pretty great. Beautiful down there. Um and we have people watching from, from Melbourne, Australia as well, Austin, Texas. Um, and we've already got 115 people joining. So that's su super exciting. Um, stakes are high. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so let's let, let's jump in. I, I do want to say a few things first. Um, I'm head of DevRel at uh, Out of Bounds, where we work on infrastructure and productivity tools for data scientists. Um uh, one thing we work on is something we built at, at Netflix called Metaflow, which is an open source framework um, to help data scientists do data science and not have to worry about configuration of YAML and all of these types of things. So you might like such things of our, as our at Kubernetes decorator, which scientists can use to access resources such as such as Kubernetes. I'm going to put um, just a link to our GitHub uh, in the chat. Um, if anyone's interested, sorry, people are talking about Taco Bell and, and Texas in the chat, which 
is fantastic. I also love Torchy's Tacos in, in Austin, Texas. Um, and one other thing uh, before we get started is the, the next fireside chat we're going to have in a month. Um, I'm also very excited for it's with uh, Peter Wang, um, who is, among other things, the CEO at Anaconda. Um, and he was instrumental in a lot of ways, just as you were instrumental in a lot of aspects, Simon, of um, of the Python ecosystem, including the frame the framework side with, with Django. Peter has been in instrumental very much on the PyData side um, in, in, in terms of the NumPy, um, Scikit-learn, Pandas, Stack, all of these, these types of things. Is he in Australia? No, he's actually in Austin, Texas. Ah, okay. Um, <laughs> but he grew up in Tennessee. Australian presence. Gotcha, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but of course... He started Continuum Analytics, which then became Anaconda, and they do a, a lot of work. And he also created, um, was one of the creators of PyData and NumFocus in order to figure out how to fund the, the PyData ecosystem, essentially. Um, uh, so that'll be fun if anyone's interested in joining joining for that. Um, but I'm here with Simon Willison. So I'm going to introduce you, Simon, and you can correct anything yeah. that, that, I, that I get incorrect. But you're a creator of, you created Dataset. Um, which I'm excited to talk about, which is an open source tool for exploring and publishing data. And the intention is for it to be for non, non-technical people. And I actually saw this morning that you'll um be going to a, a journalism conference um to yes. soon to um, teach well, people how to do that. Data set was originally inspired by data journalism. The idea is what well, one there are lots of ideas, but the big one is that journalists work with data a lot. They need tools that let them do the kinds of things that you'd normally need a small army of data analysts to, to work with, except that you're a newspaper, so you don't have that. And they also need to be able to publish the data because when you're telling a story with data, it lands a lot. It's, it's, it's a lot more trustworthy if the data behind the story is published as well. So data sets started out as the best way to put data online. And it's since been growing into ways of analyzing data and cleaning data. And there's a whole realm of things around it with the plugin system, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit. Fantastic. Um, and of course, as I've already mentioned, uh, you're a co-creator of Django. Uh, you're a member of the PSF, the Python Software Foundation uh, board, LLM aficionado, Somewhat recently coined the term prompt injection and uh, an active poster on Hacker News. Um, so these these are a bunch of things that <laughs> that, that, I, that I find interesting about you. Um, but one thing when we first spoke that I found is just how excited you were about how software can help everybody automate tasks in their work and daily lives, whether they have CS degrees or not. Um, so we're here to talk about a lot of things from you know Python side to the data side, but also how LLMs, among other types of Gen AI models, um, have this promise, but may not have delivered yet, and how they can in in, in right. future, as well. Yeah, I mean, um, for me, this is the the. There are so many dark visions of our sort of AI enhanced future, and there are a lot of concerns that are very legitimate. Um, but the on the optimistic side, my sort of utopian version of this is, I think we might finally be able to get, get to a point where human beings can automate things in their lives using computers. Which, because we're in this absurd state right right now, where you kind of need a computer science degree to automate a tedious thing with a computer, like mm. beyond Microsoft Excel, that you kind of hit a wall in terms of what you can get done. And I'm seeing little hints that maybe LLMs are the tool that get us past that. Maybe we finally found something we can use to build things. So if somebody has something repetitive and tedious they need to get done, they can get they can they can automate that thing. Ideally, without having to depend on anything else, without having to pay for it, just using the devices that they have available to them, and that really excites me. Like if we can, mm. if we can solve that sort of end user program. It's been called end user programming in the past. People shouldn't have to learn to program in order to to, to automate computers, and that that's the thing I'm most excited about, really. Fantastic. Um, and we actually we have a lot of comments in the chat, but someone I has just written, "Thank you, Simon, for all you've created, such that we can be better developers." Um, oh, so thank that's. You. Um, so I'd like to start with Python and then move into data, then move into generative AI and LLMs. I think that that makes sense as as a flow here. Um, as someone who's been working in the Python space for, for for decades now, I'm interested in why you think Python quote unquote won. Um, so for example, um, Ruby was a really strong contender in web development. Go is high performance. JavaScript has a lot of similar benefits. 
Um, why are we all writing Python code now or getting chat GBT or Copilot to write Python code for right. us? I think there's a few things here. One of my favorite um, sort of ideas about Python, Python is the second best programming language for everything you could possibly want to do. Like pick no. any area, there will be a language that is a better fit, but it might not be good for everything else. Python is general purpose enough. It's very good at a whole bunch of things. But if you learn Python, you can then take on web development and then you can take on data science and you can even do GUI development. There's so much stuff you can do if you've got Python in your pocket. And Python, because its background was as a teaching language, you know, it, it, it evolved. From, from work that Guido van Rossum was doing on educational programming languages. It's got a very decent learning. It's got a good learning curve for pe people getting started. I love that hello world in Python is print parentheses hello world. Like that's just such a great way to, to help people get started with the language. But it grows really well. Like you can use Python for a one line script. You can use Python for a million line giant monolith and it'll fit both of those things. It has characteristics for all of that. And then on top of that, I feel like Python... It, we, it got a little bit lucky in that we had, as data science started to, to take off, Python was very well equipped for that because of um, projects like Pandas and NumPy and so forth. And then when the AI boom came along, Python was right there with all of those things already in place. You had libraries like PyTorch that are at the center of pretty much everything that anyone's doing in, in AI stuff. And that's been amazing. And yeah, I, 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 so I think really it comes down to being general purpose, being old enough now that Python is, um, there's this wonderful phrase of boring technology, right? There's a, a advice where whenever you're building something, try and pick the most boring technology to build it on so that any problem you run into, other people have seen before. You know, you'll find the answers to all of your problems and you can focus your creativity on solving that one unique set of problems that's that's special to your product. And uh, this is something I'm very proud of. Django itself is definitely boring technology now, which is thrilling to me. I love that something I helped build is now categorized as so uninteresting. You can just default to it for, for building projects and know that you won't run into any problems. Absolutely. And I'm glad you mentioned Pandas as well, because I do think, you know, my background's in, in scientific research and then I entered data science, machine learning, these types of things. And that's how I got into Python. And it was when um, Pandas Read CSV came out that I think that really changed the game for a lot of us working working in scientific research. Um, and then, of course, all all the things built on top of that, that with the with the Jupyter ecosystem and notebooks I was as say, well. We I should think. give a shout out to, to Jupyter notebooks. Like I remember I, I was playing with IPython, which was the the original project for Jupyter. It was just a really good terminal. And I loved it. And when I saw that there was an IPython version that ran in the browser, I thought that was a dumb idea. I'm like, why would you ever want that? It took me an embarrassingly long time to cotton on to quite how incredible the, 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 the IPython notebooks and then Jupyter notebooks were. And yeah, I've been using them on a daily basis for like six or seven years now because they're, they're such a, I, I love exploratory programming and I love REPLs. I love being able to type a line of code and hit enter and see what it does. And Jupyter is basically the, it's 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 that idea just taken to, taken taken as far as you can possibly take it. I think it's an incredible boon to, to the Python world, definitely. Absolutely. And the idea of a REPL is the idea of science in a lot of ways, of having these environments where you run a short experiment, you see the result, you iterate, you do all of these things. And Jupyter Notebooks, of course, I think probably Mathematica Notebooks were one of the original, right. you know, um, literate programming environments. But I used to work in biology, so I worked with a lot of people who had their biology notebooks, right, where they'd write down their experiments, paste in their PCR yeah. gels, and of course... Notebooks are exactly a computational version of that, where you get to run experiments in line and then see the results, um, which is super cool. Um, so I want to talk about Django for a bit. So Django's nearly two decades old. So congratulations. It is two decades old now. It's um at least we started work on working on it in 2003. The release was in 2004. So I'm pretty sure it's coming up on its it's coming up on its 20th public birthday. Um, no, it Amazing. was in 2004, wasn't it? I'm just checking. Introducing. No, maybe it was 2003. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's definitely, it's in its 20s now, which is pretty, is pretty astonishing to me. Very cool. So I want to know, if you have oh, a well, time so machine. 2005, the public release of Jan Django was July 2005. Right. So it's, it's not quite there yet, but it, it's 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 rolling up pretty soon. Should have a party next year. Um, 
we had an amazing 10th birthday party for it. We all went back to Lawrence, Kansas, where it was born and had a, a Django's 10th birthday. So it'd be pretty amazing to have a 20th. Amazing. Um, also, someone's just commented in the chat. Um, they're from the Bay Area. They use Simon's LLM Cly daily. So awesome. We're going to show that off cool. a little bit at the end, I think. Yeah, That's yeah. A, we're going to we're going to do a, a, a demo of that a bit later. Um, but if you had a time machine, what would you tell the Simon of 2005 about how the web will develop and what what do you think would surprise him hmm. i've got the cynical version of that which is back in 2005 we thought if you make the sum total of human knowledge avail available to every human being they'll make better decisions with their lives and everything will be a beautiful utopia and it turns out that that doesn't necessarily work out that way you know um but i don't think i'd give myself the the, the sort of cynical angle on it um I don't know. I mean, one of the things I love is that back in 2005, two projects that were just getting started were Wikipedia and OpenStreetMap. And both of those projects Imagine. were ridiculously, just obviously stupid, right? You can't just have an encyclopedia yeah, yeah. anywhere. <laughs> like it. And I, OpenStreetMap, I remember when that started and they were like, yeah, and we're going to get on our bicycles with GPS trackers and, and, and do a map of the whole world. And that worked. They both worked so incredibly well. And that's so that's a super inspiring thing, right? Like we have this this substrate, the internet, where if you get the incentives right, you build the right projects and, and get people excited, you can build utterly extraordinary things. And so I, I feel like that's mm. that's the sort of positive, the positive thing that I tell myself back then. Absolutely. Um, speaking about the web taking decades to mature and become mainstream, um, do you think LLMs and Gen AI will follow a similar path or do you think it will happen faster or, or, or slower? I mean, it's pumping pretty fast already, right? Like um, a mm. year ago, what, where are we? February 28th. A year ago, we did not have any decent models that ran on a laptop. And I didn't think it was possible, right? I thought that you needed a, a rack of servers to run a language model. And then Llama came out. Actually, it was February last year, so it was just a year ago. And everything took off that way. Um, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, the other thing that's really interesting about language models is... It's fascinating how they're actually more useful to individuals than they are to companies at the moment, which feels very yeah. unexpected, right? Like individuals who learn to use them can apply them in so many ways, to, to use, in, in, in so many different ways that can help them learn things and be more productive or, or do awful stuff as well. Companies, it feels, um, other than buying a chat GPT license for everyone who works for them, it's surprising to me how few big breakout LLM driven successes we've seen from sort of startups and larger companies. And that, that's kind of cool. I kind of like that this very hyped new technology is actually more useful for individuals than it is for organizations at the moment. Incredible. And actually, um, I'm working on a blog post at the moment thinking about um, kind of how people can use different, like educating people around atomic units of different Gen AI models and then stitching them together. And we'll get to the ideas of uh, Unix philosophy in, in particular soon. But I sent it to a, a friend, a business a, a business friend. Um, and he said, he said, wait a second. He said, I thought LLMs were just for text generation. He was like, I didn't realize they could do summarization or translation uh -huh. or yep. analysis. So I showed him, I was like, I said to him, tell me your top five competitors of your company. Let's put their websites into ChatGBT and ask for a competitive analysis of the space. And he was like, you can mm -hmm. do that? Um, so even these types of things, like the general purpose nature them. of it is wild. But they don't have a manual, right? Like the chat GP, the chat interface is the worst interface for learning what these things can do because you're you're just given a. Yep. It's like trying to learn the Unix command line when there's no one to to try and guide you through it, you know. And yep. so many people. One thing that worries me is a lot of people try it. Try, they try it out and they ask it a maths question. They get it wrong, which is ludicrous because it's a computer and computers are supposed to be able to do maths. And then they ask it to look up a fact for them and it gets that wrong as well. And it's like the two things that computers are good at, it's terrible at, which is which puts people off. And then the other problem is that most people will interact with ChatGPT. They'll, they'll, they'll use the three versions. They use like ChatGPT 3.5. The leap to ChatGPT 4 is so huge that I feel like we've yep. already got this weirdly stratified society where there were those of us who have figured out GPT 4. We've figured out all the things it can do and all the things it can't do, which is even more important. Like you have to know not to give it these kinds of questions and problems and so forth. And as a result, we're finding enormous value from these systems. And meanwhile, there's lots of people who've tried it once and it was clearly rubbish. And they're like, this is this is dumb hype, right? This is everyone who everyone who's into this stuff is deluding themselves with good reason because they saw the evidence with their own eyes that it was a, a bunch of bullshit. 
only it's not and that that's that's one of the things i'm most passionate about is trying to figure out how do we how do we teach people to use these systems which is hard because so much of using them is down to intuition and i don't know how to transfer my intuition from my head into someone else's head like i can look at your prompt and say that's definitely not going to work or yeah that's going to give you really good results but i can't tell you why i know those things it's just yeah. all of the experiences that i've built up so yeah like i i feel like there are things like um when people first use ChatGPT, I try and encourage them to come up with a question that it will get obviously wrong, because what you don't you don't want people thinking, okay, it's omni it's omniscient, it knows everything, it will never make a mistake. The sooner you can get to it making an obvious mistake, the better, because it sort of inoculates you against the hallucinations bit. One of the best ones there is um, pick a friend of yours who has enough of an internet presence that it will know a bit about them. And then start asking questions, and it will like completely make up where they went to university, or it'll like. Various models say yeah, I've been the someone... CTO of GitHub, but I have not been the CTO of GitHub. But that's kind of useful, seeing seeing it make those mistakes. Yeah. It says I went to Harvard, and I didn't, but I'm I'm okay with that misinformation. I don't have a huge issue with that. But also to, to your point, um, I think something which isn't computational or, so or software about it is that it isn't reproducible and does different things all the time. And... And and the fact that asking people to ask a particular question, the response, if you ask it in the middle of a conversation, it's really mm -hmm. hard to get it to backtrack, right? Like it seems to get stuck in local no minima of some sort. State. You have yep. to understand that because people are paranoid that it remembers everything you tell it. Of course, it, it resets to it. They're, they're worried that anything you say to it will be will teach the model and it'll spit that out to other people. That's kind of not true because it it's a complete blank slate every time you start a new se session except openly i say they will train future models on your input but they mm -hmm. won't tell you what that means so i have no idea if i paste my social security number into gpt4 will it spit it out to somebody else in six months time i don't think so but because all of this stuff is so hurt by this lack of transparency there are so many things where the, the companies building these things are very secretive about how the training process works. And even the, we don't even know how big GPT-4 is still, and it's been out for yeah. over a year. And that's infuriating. It's one of the many reasons I'm so excited about all of the, the openly licensed models that we're getting to play with now. Although even those, most that's of incredible. the good ones are still very secretive. I don't know what Mistral was trained on. You know, they, they never released that information. Yep. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's the most fascinating area of computer science I've ever encountered in my entire career because every single inch of it that you look at just raises more questions. It's like it's fractally interesting in terms of things. Yeah. And a lot of because questions it, are kind of scary. Yeah, and it doesn't feel like computer science. It feels no. kind of like computers a bit. Definitely doesn't feel like science. I've said, but it I've doesn't really feel like computers. Up. Well, I've gotten the trouble with my past for compa I compared it to magic. I'm like, look, it's you have to understand you're basically a wizard and you're learning spells. And if you mispronounce one of the spells, demons might pop out, pop out. Mm. And that's been, I've I've been like so, so there are people who will argue reasonably that you should never compare it to magic because that implies that people can't ever understand it. And that's and we need people to understand it. it's matrix arithmetic, right? It's just a big ball of numbers. And these things mm. may be super, super weird, but they are that they're not science fiction, even though they, they feel like science fiction all the time. But yeah, there, there are so many analogies that you can throw at this and all of them are flawed yep. in different ways. Exactly. And to your point, though, I think analogies are wonderful because you see how they resonate. Then you can also discuss the flaws. That's one of the beautiful things about right. analogies, right? Um, but I do want to get back to productivity. I, I've, I've pasted a blog post of yours um, in the chat. Uh, it's a blog called AI, AI Enhanced Development Makes Me More Ambitious with My Projects. Yeah. Not only more productive, but more ambitious. And I'm really interested in, in, in what you mean by that. That one, it's a bit of a two-edged sword in a way. The, the problem is that um, one of the problems that GPT-4 has solved for me is the need to remember any piece of trivia about any programming language. Like I used to not work in Go because I haven't quite... I never committed the like syntax of Go completely to mind. So anytime I sat down to write some mm. Go, I'd have to look up a for loop and then I'd have to look up what that symbol means and just all of that. And, you know, if you don't use a language on a sort of weekly or daily basis, you never quite develop that, that the, the fluency that you need to be super productive. 
that doesn't matter anymore, right? Because GP4 mm. and Copilot, they know the syntax. I can write a comment that says loop through every item in this slice and do whatever to it, and bump, it sticks it out there. And so as a result, I've been shipping code to production in programming languages I'm not fluent in, which I never used to do. I have code. I have a high-performance high Go web server running, which has full unit test coverage, and it's deployed via GitHub Action CI, and like it pass, if the test passes, it blows. The whole works. Everything that I think is important about writing reliable software in a language that I don't really know, but I can read. I know enough Go to read it and to test it and to make sure that it's doing the right thing. That's wild to me. Like I wrote this thing in Apple Script. Apple Script is a notoriously read-only programming language. You can read some Apple Script and guess what it does. You will never guess what the incantations are to do something. But GPT-4 knows Apple Script, so I could just tell it and yep. get a script and start using it. I do things in Bash and ZSH, and I use JQ all the time, all of these different things. And what this adds up to is that I will have an idea for a project, and it used to be that I think of a project and think, okay, but that's going to take me two or three days. I cannot justify spending two or three days on this. It would be kind of neat. But now I think, look at it and I think, you know what? I think this will take me about an hour to get a working prototype. And I can mm -hmm. always convince myself to spend an hour on something. It doesn't. It takes two or three hours because you, you always underestimate. But even then, two or three hours is enough time for me to get a project to a point where it works. It does the thing. And I'd never have built that before. It's not just about being working faster. It's about there's a cutoff point where you're like, that is going to take me too long. I'm not going to do that thing at all. And that cutoff point, yep. cutoff point has been sliced way downwards. Absolutely. So I can get to the end of the day and I've done five or six projects and <laughs> none of them were on my list at the start of the day. That's the downside. That's like the double-edged sword where if you're easily distracted, which, I mean, I've got a mug here that says easily distracted by pelicans. If you are easily distracted, there are so many, this can, this can for, for, for feed so many more distractions to you. But yeah, it is making me more ambitious. I'm taking on things that I previously would have ruled out because they'd have taken me too long and now the the activation energy to to do some of these projects just keeps on getting lower which is super mm. exciting and a little bit intimate a little bit it has its downsides as well yeah and to your point i mean i i know python i know r i know matlab because of my scientific background i know a few other a bits and pieces of a few other things which i wouldn't be comfortable trying to write code in at all but because i know these basic languages I can ask ChatGPT or whatever to generate code in any languages, really, to build stuff. Now that I understand um, a lot more, so it's quite it's it's quite amazing. Um, so I'd love to move on to data now. Um, and you introduced us to to Dataset as a project that was initially developed for for, for journalists, and you're actually. So when I woke up this morning, I checked out your blog and saw you're going to a journalism conference this week that we briefly discussed before we started the live stream. But I'm really interested. It's um, NICAR. It's the National Institute for Computer Assisted Reporting, which and CAR is an acronym. I believe they came up with in the 70s, which is when journalists started saying, OK, these mainframes full of data, surely we can use these to help us break stories. So this is not a new field where journalists have been doing hefty data reporting for, for what 40 or 50 years at this point um but at this conference every year it's, a, it's about a thousand people every, it's like the wall street journal the washington post and the new york times and all of these different publications who have like proper data nerds the data nerds get sent there and it's just heaven you know you're just surrounded by mm -hmm. the, the nerdiest like they're all the similarity is everyone's into telling story with data other than that the backgrounds are all completely vary from all sorts of different parts of the world and yeah. so forth. It's, it's really fun so how I'm interested how non-technical people so still to use the wonderful tools you build, they need to know a bit of command line and stuff. Um, I think yeah. one reason I've I found R Studio and R to be so fantastic, um, as I used to work in bi biology, right? Um, and so the barrier to entry for a lot of non-technical biologists to use R. They, they don't, it abstracts over the command line and you can actually install, there are dependency issues still, but you're able to install packages from within the IDE. We had Spider in Python for some time. I probably don't want to say much about Spider because it eternally crashed on me and frustrated me. Um, but the developers are fantastic as as well. But um, I, I am wondering, the barrier, there is still some sort of technical barrier to entry. What is that for journalists and non-technical people, and what are we going to do about it? 
this is a huge thing. So I'm building software that I want journalists to, to, to be able to use. I actually, a few years ago, um, I landed a paid fellowship at Stanford on the journalism fellowship. Where I got paid to spend a year on campus at Stanford working on projects that were beneficial to journalism, which meant hacking on my open source projects. And at the start of that year, this was one of the questions I asked myself is, do I want to go after completely non-technical journalists and build tools that they can use? Or do I want to take those journalists who are already somewhat technically savvy, they can use Excel, you know, they're, they're not programmers, but they've, they've got that sort of data literacy and build tools for those that can accelerate those people. I chose the latter because it was easier. Like when it's just one person trying to solve the non-technical user problem is a heck of a lot more harder than solving mm. the tech problem. Um, but um, then, and then I went to my first NICAR, first NICAR conference. And something that really inspired me is that there was a workshop that was a it was a intro to python with jupyter notebooks workshop and there were 50 people in that workshop who didn't know how to program and they were journalists and they wanted it so badly they were like we're getting these these files that are too big to open in excel i want to be able to report on this data i am absolutely work ready to install python on a laptop and figure all of these things out and that really inspired me i realized that the group i care about most are it's the people who have that fire in them like they're not programmers but they want to be able to solve those kinds of problems and so for a few years i was thinking about those people and then the big change for me in the past year is i've started thinking you know what with llm assistance maybe we can build quite sophisticated technical data tools for people who don't have that level of technical literacy that they might need to, to engage with the stuff at the moment. So that, that's really exciting to me. But yes, then with Dataset, um, the first version of Dataset, it was a Python, Python tool. You pip install it, you run it in your terminal, you can like run a command to deploy it onto like the cell or cloud run or whatever. And instead, instantly you've, locked, you've cut off everyone who doesn't have a Python installation, doesn't know how to pip install something, and doesn't know how to use their terminal. And that's a that's ninety nine percent of ninety nine point five percent of humans that you've you've already. And also, out. even to get them to do these installations, like suddenly you're getting them to brew install, then they're like got to like right. pseudo they need a laptop whatever. As a starting point, right? It's it's a nightmare. So I spent a bunch of time trying to solve that problem. Um, the first thing I did was I actually built a Mac application called Dataset Desktop. And it's a mm -hmm. Electron app that bundles its own Python and does this and that. And the whole point of that is it had to be an installer where you download it and you double click the installer. And now you've got data set running on your computer with, and you don't have to install Python separately. And that works. I got that up and running, um, which helps a lot because at least people don't have to use the terminal to start using the software. Then nope. I started looking at, um, I started looking at WebAssembly. So I've got a version mm. of data set Dataset Lite, which runs entirely in your browser. It uses Pyodide, which is the Python compiled to WebAssembly stack that the Jupyter. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, it's incredible. And so Dataset Lite is really cool. Like um, I thought it was, I always built it as a joke. It was like a fun experiment. Can you run a server-side Python app entirely in the browser? It's like a 10 megabyte startup cost. So I figured nobody would ever use it. Of course, these days, 10 megabyte startup cost is nothing, right? A React app is probably mm. that all. So Actually, people are starting to use it. And the fun thing that Dataset Lite can do is you can feed it the URL to a CSV file online. And if that CSV file has cause headers, which is anything on GitHub or anything in a gist, it'll just load it straight up. So now I've got this thing where I can construct a URL to load Dataset Lite and then import a CSV file and then run a SQL query against it. That's super interesting. And a lot of people yep. have started using that as well. But the end level boss of all of this is obviously I have to host this, right? I need to provide a software as a service version of data set um, so that people who want to use this, especially who want like a private version that they can collaborate with their newsroom on so that they can click a button and enter some credit card details and get started that way. And I held mm. off on this for quite a long time because I have run startups in the past. I know what it's like to be responsible for an online service and it's getting woken up at three in the morning and it's having paranoia about if your backups are working and there's, there's all sorts of stuff like that. Right from the start of data set, I said, look, it's open source, so I never have to do this, right? So if people run the software, that's great, but I am not on the hook for those 2 a.m. phone calls. It's a, I, 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 It doesn't work. It turns out for my target audience of journalists, they need to be able to click buttons on a web page and get a version of the software up and running. So I've been building this thing called Dataset Cloud, which is the cloud mm. hosted version of Dataset. Um, it's been an internal preview. I've been onboarding people to try it out and so forth. I'm finally, like, the, I feel like NICAR this year 
is the point at which I'm going to start aggressively onboarding real teams using it and start asking people for money. And that's pretty exciting. Like that's a, a huge step. Super exciting. Um, to that point, in your blog post, you mentioned you're going to Nike and you're going to spend as much time in the hallway track talking to people as as possible. In your in your extensive history of building tools, um, how important is it to actually spend time on the pe- on the ground with people talking as much as possible? Huh. So, in my career, I have spoken at over a, well over a hundred conferences. Um, and that's over a space of 20 years, you know, and almost all of the interesting job opportunities and things in my life came from either blogging or speaking. So I'm mm-hmm. a bit of a weird shape because I'm very, I, my, my career has been shaped around sort of public communication for a very long time. Um, yep. But certainly for, I mean, with, with data set, one of the frustrations I've had is that it's open source, which means people can use it without telling me. And so I keep on hearing anecdotally people. I just found out the other day that um, Politico have been experimenting with data set internally, which is amazing because I want amazing. news yeah. organizations using it. ProPublica have used it and Bellingcat have used it. But I never hear about this at the time. So I've been um, going to events and, and sort of shaking people down is a great way to figure out who's actually using things. I also do this thing where on Fridays, I let people book office hours with me. It's just like a Calendly zoom call where you can grab 25 minutes of my time and the main purpose of that is because i want to have conversations with people who are either using my software or thinking about using my software because yeah. like most weeks i will do between one and three of these office hour sessions and there could not be a more valuable way for me to spend 25 minutes than just talking to somebody about what they're trying to do what they've done what they got stuck on what they'd like it to do in the future that, that that's just amazing fantastic um so Data set, as we've discussed, is all about exploring, publishing, working with data. I'm interested in your thoughts on how you think about sharing data in the age of LLMs when everything becomes training material. Um, as we've seen, Reddit, Stack Overflow, others are already restricting data access because of this. I also want to uh, state, we talked about kind of when this Gen AI stuff started. In my mind, actually, the current Gen AI quote-unquote revolution probably started mid 2022 with the first release of stable diffusion that's when it was like wow okay this is serious stuff and you've actually um written a bunch with with andy bio i i think about um the data sets behind stable diffusion and, and, and the training of that the week that stable diffusion came out andy bio and i did a, a joint um investigation of the training data because yeah the big thing stable diffusion was that the, at least for the first version this training data was entirely in the open um and we, yep. we we were curious and we dug into that and you, i i actually i ran data set against that as well to build a way that you could search through i think it was six million of the images that we used in training it which was the a filter and was, was it the lion 5b data set lion, or... exactly it was lion 5b yep. so it was yep. trained on a lot more images than that but there were six million that were filtered as being particularly aesthetically interesting, which got sort yeah. of highest. And it was fascinating because it was all stuff off Pinterest and the Daily Mail and everything. And just faceting by, um, like uh, faceting just by the domain name showed you that where this stuff was coming from. And yeah, this was back in um, September, a year and a half ago. And yeah, it felt, it felt, it, 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 it felt like that was a, that was going to cause problems. And sure enough, it's, it's become, a huge aspect of all of this. One, I find the ethics of this stuff so interesting as well, because I think the ethics of how these things are trained, um, people's opinions vary entirely based on the, the use case, like what's actually done with it. If I scraped every photo on the internet and I used it to build a machine learning model to help blind people see the world through, through a camera, nobody's going to complain about that. And there are Techno- like GPT-4 Vision has been used for that kind of thing. If you scrape everyone's art and use it to generate new art that competes with them, obviously that 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 whether or not that's legal, it's clearly unfair, right? There's a we've we've got a sort of mm-hmm. strong we, we understand the, the 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 sort of fairness involved in these things. Um, software is an interesting one as well. Like I've been releasing open source software for twenty years. I love that my software has gone into GitHub Copilot and GPT-4 and so forth, and it helps me write code. But that's kind of the part of the point of, of open source was, was that I want to never have to solve the same problem twice. So you put yep. the code out there, you never have to think about it again. There are people who are very upset that um, 
GPT-4 and Copilot are basically laundering the licenses, right? The, the GPL, the terms of the GPL are not being obeyed. The, the attribution terms are not being obeyed when it sort of spits it back out for you in, in the, the exactly what you needed. Those are very legitimate concerns for people to have as well. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. But then the, the flip side of the ethics is there are a lot of people who are saying, no, we only want models which are trained on licensed data. The, the, the companies making these models should be paying everyone whose data goes into them. That's sort of the the, the 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 problem I have with that is I worry that we we'll end up in a world where only the wealth only the very wealthy have access to these tools. Right? If if everything if it costs you a hundred million dollars in licensing to train a model, and then you make that model available just to the people who will pay a subscription for it, yeah. we'll cut ninety nine percent of humanity from this. And what happens to open source models in this limit as well? Right? Absolutely. There's... The open yeah. yeah. Um. So I, I feel like the ethical questions. They're all incredibly murky, and I, there are basically no obviously correct or good answers to any of this stuff. And this is a pattern that plays itself out again and again in generative AI, is everything's murky and bad in different ways. And um, in the absence of, so, so we kind of end up falling back on what's legal, and what's legal isn't even clearly defined either. Absolutely. And I, I do think copyright is something which we developed due to the ability to mechanically reproduce things with the printing press and that, that type of stuff, also to incentivize more cultural production. It was the statute mm -hmm. of Anne, right, around Elizabethan times, where they were like, we're not, not enough people are writing stuff. Everything's owned by the, whatever the, the guild was at the, at the time. And we want people who create things to be able to make money a bit more afterwards. Right. But now that we have generative transformation, Copyright may not even be the right paradigm to be thinking about these things through. This is it's it's all and I I've been staying mostly clear of the the sort of legal side of it because I I I know nothing about law and, yeah. and um, all of those things. But it's just it's it's also uncertain as well. It's interesting to me that the the big AI labs one of the things they do is they give you a um they give you legal cover right if you're using Adobe's models or OpenAI I think Anthropic have this as well now Microsoft have it. GitHub have it, they will, if you get sued over the over content that their tools have produced, their legal teams will jump on your side. And I guess they kind of mm. have to because otherwise no, nobody's nobody serious will use their tools at all. But that's kind of fascinating that that's the way this stuff has gone so far. Absolutely. And I do think I am interested, and then we'll come back to more technical stuff, but what, what well, this is very important though, but us as technical people, what happens to web 2.0 spaces such as Stack Overflow, if, if all of this is gotcha. sucked up yeah. in, into large models. Like we're interacting on a one-on-one -on -one basis now with a large language model and not having communal conversations. Like not that Stack Overflow was always the best, most wonderful so, place to chat chat with people, right? But my, my favorite example of this actually is um, there's an alpha version of Google search where the search engine results page has language models that summarize everything right there on the page. And it's like... Why would you ever click a link ever again? You know, you ask Google a question, it reads the web. And, and Bing and lots of other search engines are, are looking into this kind of stuff as well. And there's just such an obvious moral hazard there in terms of um, like, okay, well, what's the point of even having a website if nobody's going to visit it? Because it's been it's been mm. sort of lauded and, and regurgitated in that way. That's one of the things at the base of the, the New York Times lawsuit against OpenAI. This is one of the things they're complaining about is, is their content being rewritten and pushed out to people in a way that harms them economically because now there's no reason for people to visit their uh, visit their site or subscribe to the newspaper and all of that kind of stuff and yeah these are these are deeply concerning to me um i feel like the topic of data my my main hat is still journalism and from a journalist's point of view i just want all the data to be out there so that i can use it to tell stories but then as an individual one of my other sort of areas of focus with data set has been around personal data where there's mm. this really interesting thing where as a human being on this planet right now there is a huge amount of data being generated about you and a lot of it is available to you right you can go and click the button on facebook to export your facebook data you can write to a credit agency and they'll send you stuff yeah, there's all of this data that you've got access to i mean my my watch collects um, my like gps traces all of that kind of stuff but what do you do with it like if, if facebook email you a zip file with 100 megabytes of xml in it What's step two? So I've been building a project called Dog Sheep, which is basically a collection of utilities for taking whatever those formats are and turning them to SQLite databases. Because once it's in the SQLite database, you can run data set on top of it, and then you can 
query, you can start trying to dig into that data that's out there about you. A lot of this stuff is brutally mm. private. Um, like there's people have asked about my dog sheep tools. Would you ever do a hosted version? And there's no way I want to do a hosted version of a system where people pay me five bucks a month to host their deepest, most private data. That is not something I, I'm interested in getting involved with, you know, yeah. but there's demand for Absolutely. it. I would love to be able to run data set on my iPhone with all of my personal data on a device I can hold in my hands. That feels like yeah. the right way to start coping with that sort of thing. Very much so. Um, I'm interested in, we hinted at this, but the ability, so firstly, training models from generative AI models from scratch has been su super expensive, right? But even mm. you've written about that, there are some smaller models which now you can train for on the order of 30, I 40, thousand dollars right? Like Microsoft's Phi 2, PHI 2, cost them... Yep. In, it was less than $100,000 in training costs, I believe. It's incredible. That's now, it's not quite accessible to the hobbyist, but that's accessible to like uh, the, the the smaller groups. And the fine-tuning stuff, right? So many of those models on Hugging Face, the really good ones, were fine-tuned practically in someone's bedroom, right? There, were, there was an mm -hmm. army of open source like of, of, of openly licensed model people out there who have tuning models, which often beat other things on the scoreboards because it all comes down to how well you instruction tune it and the examples you give it. And that's pretty exciting. And at the same time, everyone talks about having a model trained on their personal data. You probably don't want that. You probably want to do the rag thing instead. You want to do, you want to give an existing model the ability to run SQL queries against your data or to run searches against your notes and, and pull things back that way. And that's getting to a point where it's, it does fit on the telephone. Like M Mistral 7B yeah. as a model is quite good at function calling and stuff. And I've got that running on my phone. Like Mistral 7B does, does fit on an iPhone now. Um, so that's exciting. Like, I feel like that's that's one of the things I'm most excited about with the open license models is I want a model that runs on my own device and can use tools to access all of my data and it completely disconnected from the internet. There's no servers involved at all. It's just running locally. And I think we're basically there right now in terms of the models are good enough and hardware is good enough. We just haven't built the software. And the software is, is getting there mm -hmm. as well. Like my, my open source LLM tool is beginning to lean in that direction right now. And so if people uh, viewing and listening wanted to um, like get stuff running on their phone or locally on laptop, what type of tools would you suggest okay. them to so use? On the iPhone, there's an app called MLC Chat. Mm -hmm. Just install that. It's in the App Store. You install it. It gets you Mistral 7B. It is a language model that runs on your phone. It doesn't integrate with anything else. So it's more of a sort of fun, cool demo prototype kind of thing. But yep. the moment, the first moment you run a language model on your phone, the, just sort of you can see the future opening up in front of you. And in terms of desktop stuff, I write, I have an open source Python tool called LLM, just lowercase, which you can pip install. And that's um, it's a command line tool for originally it was for running command line using your terminal to run prompts through OpenAI. But then mm -hmm. I added plugin support to it. And now you can install plugins that add local models as well. So for a very brief period, that was one of the easiest way to run a local model on a Mac. It's not anymore mm. because there are much more sort of um, like much more full-time projects. There's a great project called Olama for this. Um, there's a whole bunch of like desktop apps that you can install on the Mac that get models up and running for you. I think um, uh, LM Studio, I think it's not open source, but it's free and it's it's very, it's got a really good interface. There's loads of options. Like there are, there are a ton of ways that you can start doing this. You do need quite a lot of RAM. Like um, I'm running an yeah. M2 Mac with 64 gigabytes of RAM, which is good enough for most of the, the models that I want to play with. If you've got a Linux or Windows machine with an NVIDIA card, your options are much wider because so many of these models target NVIDIA CUDA stuff first. But yeah, it's exciting. And if you haven't done it, one of the things I love about the little models that run on your device is they are rubbish. Like, yeah. you think GPT-4 hallucinates? Watch what Mistral 7B does when you ask it for your, your bio. But that's really useful because if you're working with a weak model that hallucinates a lot, you get a much better sort of mental model of, of how it works and what it can do. Like, it feels a lot less mysterious when your laptop is writing a terrible poem about a pelican for you. And you can almost, like, feel it, like, just predicting what word could come next in the sentence. Totally. Totally. And all of that is wonderful advice for people wanting to try to stump, run stuff locally. I've also included a link in the chat to um 
a subreddit, the local llama subreddit, it's which amazing. I that's, think that's is the best place on the internet for yeah. catching up on all of this stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a it's a wonderful place. Um, I um, there are a few things that we've been talking around that I kind of want to tie together that correspond to certain questions in the chat as well. Um, people are asking about how how can we trust LLMs. The answer is you can't, right? But you, 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 you did mention um, RAG, I think, yeah. which is an interesting way to essentially query data you have and also get provenance from your results as well. Yeah, let, let's talk about RAG a little bit because RAG is, so RAG, it stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation, which I don't think it's a great name, but it's got a name. That's the important thing. And all RAG is, it's a party trick. Basically, what it lets you do is you can say to a language model, um, well, you, you can, so if I want to answer a question, I could ask my, about my notes or whatever. Obviously, the language model won't know, but if I do a really dumb search against my notes, and I copy and paste like a few thousand characters of stuff around that search result into the language model. And at the bottom, I say, based on the above information, answer this question and then give it the question. It actually does really well. Language models are fantastic mm. answering things based on stuff that you've just told them like 30 seconds ago. And so yeah. once you know this trick, it's, it's also fun because building this stuff, like if you want to start hacking with language models, Building a basic version of this is so trivial. Like the hello world of language model hacking is getting a very basic rag pipe pipeline up and running, but it's crazy valuable. Like it's it's a super useful thing. There's a, I, I would warn you that getting basic rag working is easy. Getting really good rag working is incredibly hard. And there's lots of people and companies who've been trying to figure this out because there are so many ways it can go wrong. And you you end up that the, the difficult technical problem is given a user's question, deciding what search terms to run against what data and which bits to put in the context and all of this. And that's a very fine sort of art and craft. But the really basic versions of it, um, a trick I, try, I I started using just a few weeks ago is um, I really like rip grep, which is, or RG. It's like a, a faster version of grep. And so you can say RG, mm -hmm. give it a term, and then you can say and dash C for context, 10 and it will find all matches of that thing and it'll output the like 10 lines before and after and so i've been piping that into a language model i go rg this concept and i pipe it to a language model and say explain the concept of of um of ribbon bars in this code base and it just works yeah. it's and this is well, like my llm tool is all about um terminal usage because it turns out unix pipes and language models are a beautiful combination right a language model all it really is is a function, right? You give the you give it the prompt as input, and it gives you the response as output. So once you've got the ability to chain these things together in your terminal, you can do things like grep search for this thing and pipe the results into the language model of this question, and whatever comes back out, save it to a file, and and it all just works. It's so much fun. The um my mm. LLM my command line tool. The other trick it's got, so it can you can give it a prompt and it'll give you the response on the on the terminal. You can install plugins to give you access to dozens of other language models, API ones and local ones as well. And everything it does is saved to SQLite because everything I do is is saved to SQLite. So you end up with a SQLite nope. database of every experiment you've ever run against every language model. I've got like thousands and thousands of prompts and responses stashed away now. And so I can start using them to compare. Very cool. Did this prompt work better than this prompt? Which model handled this better? It's it's super cool. And you could just start holding yeah. all of the different interactions. Amazing. Um there's a lot a lot of things to, to unpack there. I do I, I agree that the name rag isn't is isn't the best name, but it does give us the pun from rag to riches, <laughs> which I which, which I like. Um I also just pasted in the in the chat um, the I I can hardly say this because it's a, it's the Uber Booga um, tool which yes it's, that's the point it allows you to right? play around with a lot of these things in yeah in, in in a GUI vibe so if people want to play around with these things locally or even using cloud cloud resources oh, it's a nice yeah, way yeah. To, to to do it I also um I'm glad. You mentioned Unix because this is something that you and I've chatted about before. Um, but Unix philosophy is something that, I mean, this idea of, of, of piping, among other things, is very beautiful. It's actually related in some ways to the Zen of Python as well. So I'm, I'm wondering, with Unix philosophy and Pythonicness, for lack of a better term, um, these are clearly a part of your approach to software development. And how how do these philosophies guide your approach to developing tools like Dataset, 
LLM and everything else you, right. you do? I mean, I think I've got I, my work's gone slightly beyond like the Unix philosophy is all about piping one thing into another, which is actually quite restrictive. Like you can get a lot done. You mm. can end up getting quite a lot done if you but you end up start, starting to think things like, OK, this is structured data. So now am I going to produce JSON that I piped something else that has to understand it? There's, there are limits to how much you can do with it. But I've also grown up on the web. So I'm always interested in anything with like web APIs where I can kill an endpoint and get back JSON and do things with that. Um, and then the two things that I've added in the past few years, there's firstly, there's SQLite as the intermediary format for absolutely everything. Because the great thing about SQLite databases is they're a single file, so you can email them to someone or upload them or create a copy or whatever. And SQLite has bindings in every programming language known to man, right? Go, Go and Python and Ruby and R, everything can talk to SQLite. It runs in the browser and WebAssembly these days. It's also got amazing backwards compatibility guarantees or forwards compatibility. I can open a SQLite database from 10 years ago and it'll just work today because the team maintaining it are very stringent about that. So a lot of what I've been doing over the past few years, my, my one trick is anything I think is interesting, I get into a SQLite database because once it's in a SQLite database, I can then throw all of my other tools at it as well. Um, yep. And I've been building my, my sort of third big open source project. You've got Dataset and LLM. I have this tool called SQLite Utils, which is a combination Python library and command line tool for manipulating SQLite databases. So on the command line, you can do things like download, uh, like pull a JSON file from somewhere and pipe it into this tool, and it will create the SQLite database with the table with the right columns, depending on the JSON that was sent into it. And that works with CSV mm. and CSV and so forth. But it can also do things like turn on full text search indexes or alter tables, drop columns, refactor data, apply conversion functions, a whole bunch of stuff like that. And that was originally built to solve the question of how do I get data into data sets where data sets great if you've got a SQLite database, but I need everything to be in a SQLite database as well. But it's also a Python library. So anything you can do through the command line, you can do through the Python library instead. And dozens of tools that I built use that as a dependency. So I've got tools for like yeah. pulling GitHub issues and piping into a SQLite database. And that's it's a little Python thing built around that. So that's trick number two is, so you've got the Unix pipes, you've got the web APIs, you've got the um, SQLite substrate for everything. And then the other one is plugins, right? Dataset has mm. 145 plugins at this point, um, very much inspired by WordPress, right? I was looking at WordPress, which is a decent blogging engine in CMS with 10,000 plugins that mean that any publishing content, any content problem you have, you can solve it with WordPress plus plugins. And it's now responsible for what, 25% of the internet runs on WordPress or something ludicrous like that. And so yep. goal I had with data set was, okay, if I can build a capable sort of um, data publishing and analytical engine at the start with plugin support, you could add plugins for any visualization, for any data cleaning mechanism, just, just try and make that as, as sort of, um, like try and expand the software in different directions there. I use the same trick for my LLM tool. It's got plugins again for the same reason. So when mm. you combine those you've got plugins and you've got SQLite database substrate, you've got sort of web native APIs and you've got Unix piping, you can build so many things with that combination of different techniques. Yeah, amazing. Um, I also just want to mention a couple of people have mentioned um, vector databases in the uh -huh. chat and that rag uses vector databases totally correct to, i feel like as soon as that can. that yeah yeah i was just gonna say i think as soon as someone mentioned vector databases a whole bunch bunch of venture capitalists jumped in and joined <laughs> joined, joined the live stream um but that's and somebody mentioned fine-tuning as and something else we can do we haven't really talked about that i think there's a lot out there about fine-tuning um but essentially yeah, I, you know what it so i suppose my one question databases. I, I did. I gave a talk a few months ago about embeddings, which is the sort of core idea at the the basis of why you'd want a vector database. And that's that's available as a video and very detailed slides and notes and code examples. Um, plus, my LLM command line tool can do embedding stuff as well. So if anyone's interested in in embeddings, I've got a bunch of material people can look at. Great. Um, and with respect to fine tuning, I think there's enough out there that I don't necessarily. There are so many things that you can talk about that other people can't, that I, I don't want to spend too much time on, on, on fine tuning, but I do think one question for you is that, you know, there are two worldviews. Uh, Sam Altman says, oh, the world will have one big model, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's, an, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But there's an, 
I mean, at the opposite end of the spectrum, the world may have a lot of different small open source models that are fine-tuned or rag on, on, on relevant data for their particular use cases. And where th those are two different options. Where do you sit with yeah. respect to- I want that second world. I, I, I feel like, like even when you just look at things like cultural values, right? A, a model trained in California should not it does not necessarily work for every country in the world right there's there are so many things around like when, when you're talking about what language models do where where different people should be able to select different models that represent different values that that feels really mm. important to me so yeah i'm yeah. all for one of the things i think like, a year or so ago it felt like we might be doomed to a world where there was one there was whatever open air had done and every human being was using it and that felt very bad and I'm not worried about yep. that anymore because the the openly licensed models have been improving so much and there's so much variety and so many different research groups are working on these. And you've got people on Hugging Face who are training a model in their bedroom that are fine-tuning it in different directions. I think that's amazing. That's that's the world that I want to yeah. live in. Absolutely. Um, I want to jump into a, a, a demo soon, but we've talked about SQLite quite a bit. And I love SQLite and it stood the test of time as well. There's some Lindy law, right? Which is, you know, something that's been around for a certain amount of time. It's probably going to stick around um, and deliver value for, for for more time. So I'm, I'm convinced that SQLite is incredibly valuable. Um, but there's this whole new crop of tools in in, in yeah. Python, which seem that like DuckDB and, and Polars and, and, and these types of things. So um, what do you think about all these new tools? Do they complement or compete with SQLite? Or? So my favorite of all of these is DuckDB because DuckDB yeah. really, is, they took the SQLite idea deal of it's a library, not a server, and it's like a single file database and so forth. Uh, but they basically, they're going after these sort of um, the, the parquet, the column of, and the analytical databases, all of that kind of stuff. And it's a phenomenally cool piece of software. I think it, I, I see it as a compliment to SQLite. I feel like if you want something that's transactional and like optimized for for like um lots of like reads and writes and so forth sqlite is still absolutely the best option if you want to do mm. big like analytical queries duckdb is is sat right there and it's it's got the one trick it has that i really love is that it can fetch parts of a parquet file um, over the network, just just the bits that it needs to answer a query. So you can have a terabyte of parquet in an S3 bucket somewhere. You can run DuckDB on your laptop to do like a summer account, and it will pull back just fractions of those files to answer those questions. It's incredible. It's like you've got a full blown data warehouse running on a laptop with terabytes of data that are that are hosted elsewhere. So yeah, I'm a huge fan of DuckDB. If I ever get Dataset to have a plugin hook that lets you swap out databases, I want to go after DuckDB and Postgres because I think. If you've got SQLite, DuckDB, and Postgres, that's it. You can solve almost anything. So many like data yeah. warehouses reach the Postgres po protocol now. That would be incredible. And a year ago, I thought that was impossibly difficult. I'm beginning to feel like it might be achievable once I've got the data set 1.0 mm. release. So that, that would be really exciting. Very cool. Um, one other thing I want your your thoughts on. So I think a lot of people here, including yourself and me, will be aware. Um, Andre Karpathy published a blog post several years ago uh, called uh, about Software 2.0, and this was before LLMs uh, really mm. became mainstream. Maybe even I mean Transformers had come out, I think. But the suggestion there was a new paradigm of programming around models instead of lines of code. Um, yes. And I'm interested in. You know, you've been involved in software 1.0, 2.0, and I'm interested in this kind of triangle, I suppose, of code, like the vertexes, vertices, vertexes would be um, uh, code, models, and data, hopefully with humans in in, in, in in the middle somewhere. So how how do all of these things interact and what will humans be doing in the future? So... I mean, that's a bit, that's way too big a question for me to take on. I, I try not to be too futuristic <laughs> in my thinking because everything changes every week. I understand. So, yeah, yeah. Interesting, that Andre Carpathy, um, uh, that, that post, I think that was a couple of years ago before we'd realized quite how good language models are at code, right? The fact that language models are astonishingly good at SQL and JavaScript and Python and Go and so forth mm -hmm. was a bit of a surprise to everyone. It was only, only started becoming clear about maybe a year and a half ago. And code is obviously a better way to automate a computer than 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 language than than English because English is um it's vague, right? Like if you if you want the computer to be yeah. you want to give it less ambiguous instructions. So 
I'm much more excited about the thing where the language model is the the computer the, the code is what automates the computer, but the language model is is building the code, is helping people build the code. That that feels more more sort of that feels like it's definitely going to work because it's working already. Right, right now, yep. I can do so many things with my ability to get a language model to write code for me. And if we can expand that out to people who don't have a programming background, that's going to be incredible, I think. Um, so yeah, that's me being sort of less ambitious but optimistic. I'd like us to more or less like like let, let's harness our computers the the sort of rationable, predictable way with code, but the language models mean that everyone gets to do it that way. Cool. Um, and you actually raise an, an interesting point that I think you've written about before, and we definitely spoke about it last time we spoke, um, which is that it seems like perhaps the most value LLMs currently deliver is for technical people to help them yeah. write code, right? That's the, the, um, one of the wild things is the the career that is that can benefit the most from LLMs turns out to be programmers. In terms of if you can master an LLM, if you can master LLMs for programming, you can. I say I've four or five x to my productivity in terms of the time I spent typing code into a computer, which is only about five mm -hmm. or ten percent. I do, but still, that's material, right? That that's worthwhile. Yep. Um, it's it's at the same time it's so weird. Like we thought we thought truck drivers were going to be replaced by automation, and it turns out. And like illustrators and and lawyers and um and programmers have maybe have more to worry about. I'm hoping that as we get more productive, the demand that the human human species has for code will 10x, and we'll all be kept busy that way. Yeah, it's uh, it's confusing. Time will tell. Um, so one final question before we jump into a, a demo, and this is a couple of people have asked similar things in in the chat. Um. There are a lot of conversations around Gen AI happening publicly in cultural consciousness on Twitter, LinkedIn, all of these spaces. Is there anything about them that isn't being talked about enough that you'd like to see more of a conversation around? Yeah, the thing I'm most interested in is there's lots of people who are super stressed out about um, the, the doomsday scenario. I, I'm not interested in the science fiction Terminator stuff. I'm really interested in the economic impact these things are happening. Yep. And I want to see more than just anecdotal stuff around how, the impact this is having on jobs, right? Like they're, they're anecdotally people who used to do like SEO copywriting are in real trouble right now. Or mm. like illustrators who were doing just very sort of like sort of like stock up kind of illustration. But that I, I keep on thinking about translators, right? The translation industry was massively impacted five or six years ago when Google Translate started getting good enough that companies would use it. When it started using deep learning, essentially, right? All of that kind of stuff. So we've seen this yeah. play out already. But that to me is the big question. Like, I want to understand how is this affecting people? Are people like, find, like, like that's the story that's not being told properly, I think, is the, the, the macro story about the economic impact this stuff is happening. Absolutely. And I mean, we've been talking around this, but the New York Times is one of the last bastions of serious journalism, because look, I mean, look what the internet did to mainstream journalism, right? Yep. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the problem um, that journalism has is be, running a newspaper used to be the best business model that there was because you had a monopoly on advertising for your city right and so yeah. it was a license to print money this is why you hear these stories of and the same like magazines vogue had a monopoly on all of the eyeballs in the the world that cared about fashion and this is why we hear these stories in the 80s and 90s of like the unlimited credit card expense accounts for magazine writers and all of that kind of stuff that is so far gone now because those monopolies on attention for like regional attention and topic attention just got blown blown away by facebook and google and targeted advertising and so forth and the problem is that how do you, newspapers are expensive? Like reporting is an expensive thing. How do you pay for that when the business model used to be your everyone has to advertise with us because it's the only way to get their message in front of everyone who lives yep. in this town? And that's just gone. And yeah, that's really worrying. And the um a trend that I found really interesting is there are increasing numbers of non-profit newsrooms, which are supported through other means and are doing really good, deep investigative reporting and so forth. But I don't think you can run it. You can't. Non-profit newsrooms are not going to cover everything that needs covering. And this is a lot of the work that I do. I hate to say it out loud, but newsrooms need to be able to do more with less, right? They do have to be able to cover the like the, on the reduced budgets and, and resources they have. They need to be able to tell the important stories that are happening in the areas that they cover. And if data journalism, if 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 automation can help with help people find those stories, 
that feels worthwhile. Right? That's something that I'm, I'm ready to invest a lot of time in. Absolutely. Um, well, let's jump into a demo. And so why don't you share your screen? And as Simon's doing that, I'll just let everyone know beforehand, I said to Simon, hey, do you want to like demo your LLM, um, cloud utility or data set? And, and Simon said, both of those are great, but I've got something maybe even more exciting we can we can look at. So let's do it. Okay. So this is this is data set, just to give you an idea of what it's like. Data set, it's a table, right? It's a table of data. You can have multiple tables in here. This is um legislators. This is everyone who's ever been a congressperson or senator or president or president or vice president in the United States. Um, and you can do things like facets. So I can say pass it by last name and see that unsurprisingly there have been more Smiths than anyone else who have, have served in. Mm -hmm. Although Wilson at 60, that's a bit unexpected. Wow. Huh. That is a much more common name than I thought it would be. Mm. Um, so that's like every time I learned this stuff, I learned something new. Um, but also you can, I can click view and edit SQL and I can actually start hacking on SQL queries, um, which because it's done, it's done read only and with a, um, with a time limit. So ideally it shouldn't cause any trouble. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. so that's what it lets you do. It lets you get data and put it in an interface where people can explore it, they can run queries, and you can also get the data out as JSON. So if you want to um, like build integrations against it, you can do that. You can export as CSV, all of that kind of stuff. But the challenge has always been, how do you get data into this in the first place? And I've built features like what? CSV up, uh, upload and stuff in the past. But my new thing is a new plugin. Everything's a plugin called Dataset Extract. And the idea here is that you can paste data in and a bit of a table schema. So let's say I'm going to pass my resume. So start year, end year, description, oh, and roll. Let's do that. So then what I can do is I can grab a copy of my resume. It's a PDF. I'm just going to drop it onto here. I've extracted the text from PDF just in JavaScript. You'll note that this is garbage, right? It's um, it's complete yeah. junk, got extra spaces. But fingers crossed, if I click extract, what this is doing is it's sending it up to GPT-4 with a GP, it's using um, OpenAI functions and Oh, that's frustrating. I've got a new version of this that actually shows you live what's going on. It looks like I'm running the old version. We'll have to wait until it's finished. But what this will do um, is I'll show you one I built earlier, just in case the the, the live demo doesn't work. What For this sure. does, it, it pulls out the company, the start year, the end year, the job title, the job description. So I've just Amazing. turned random pile of junk PDF into actual useful data. And this works with, I've copied and pasted things off of websites into it. And I've done like plain text files, whatever. It's one of the killer features of um, the OpenAI models is this ability to work with structured data. Um, oh, look at this. No, it is actually working. Here we go. So it's extracting in progress. And this, oh, very uh, cool. As, as it pulls new things out, because it's all streaming, it's pulling in the data. And so this is a preview. And then when, I, when it's finished, I'll be able to click through. Actually, I can click through to the table right now. Here we go. Here's the table that it's creating from that data. I am so excited about this feature. The um, I want to get it working with GPT Vision as well because you can do structured data extraction from images now, and it works. Mm. Like I've been taking photos of event flyers in shop windows and getting GPT-4 Vision to turn them into Google Calendar ad links. So you take a photo of a flyer and you click a link and it's in your calendar, and that just works. Um. But yeah, so this is a fun you, example. So can you just say that again? Because that's so amazing. Yeah, yeah. Take a photo of a flyer. And then I've actually, I've been playing around with this just in ChatGPT. You can say to ChatGPT, construct a Google Calendar, like add to calendar link for this date, this event. And it will pull out the title and the start date and the end date and the venue information and field it correctly. And I took one, I did one of a, something in Spanish and it converted to English as well. Like it translated it for me. Amazing. Super cool. So you can see instantly that the potential for this stuff as a journalist is just enormous, right? Like this is, yep. journalists spend so much time dealing with crap PDF files that some police department sent them or whatever. The fact that we can now turn that into structured data and then start running SQL queries against it, that's huge, right? That's that that's a really yeah. exciting thing. Very cool. And is this something you're going to take to NICAR next week? It is. Yes, this is. Um, I've been trying to get this already in time for NICAR because uh, it's It's actually, I think it's, I haven't started talking about it yet, so it doesn't have a readme, but it's called Dataset Extract. The code's all up on, on GitHub already. 
and there's not a lot to it like it's all of this stuff because this is the joy of plugins it like this is what 310 lines of python this whole thing the thing i love about yeah. having a plug system for my software is that it's zero risk for trying out new ideas like if i was mm. going to hack this idea into data set core and it turned out to be the code was a bit messy or i didn't have time to test it properly i would be making data set worse because it would have this sort of unfinished feature in it plugins there is no harm caused whatsoever i have come up with the weirdest idea f ideas for features and built them as a plugin just as a like often an experiment and it's fine right it, if you don't install it you don't have to think about it it's it's a really it's also my favorite way of doing open source contribution now in the the problem with open source is if somebody sends you a pull request, they've actually just added work to your tray, right? Now I've got to review their pull request and go and round to them. And it's great to have those contributions, but it is also something that, that, that adds to the stack of things I have to do. If somebody builds a plugin for my software, it costs me nothing and they can release it to the world. And I can literally wake up one morning and now my software can do something new that it couldn't do before. That's so mm. cool. That's that's something I, I've I've been really enjoying about this this whole um this whole way of working. So if I go to data, here we go. This is and also to your directly. point about pull requests and our conversation around analogies earlier. Um, a nice analogy for opening a pull request is giving someone a puppy, right? Which is lovely, but then exactly. you've, you've got to right. well, you've got to you look after it. My software, I don't have to look after it at all. It's just it's out there. Yeah. And check this out. Dataset reconcile last had a release on the second of February. And this adds like reconciliation APIs for working with um, with uh, uh, Open Refine. And that's such a cool feature. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm all about plugins. This is why my LM my LLM command line tool is all about plugins as well. And I think how many have we got now? We've got about this is quite decent, right? One, two, three, four, five. There's about twenty plugins for that now. And quite a few of these Amazing. were written by other people, like the Cohere one, the Bedrock Anthropic one, the Bedrock Meta one. Those were all written. And um, LLM Claude, the one that gives you access to the Anthropic models. I didn't write those. Very cool. Uh, software can now do it. It's really cool. Amazing. And look, if I know we we're going to wrap up on the hour. We've got a, but if you want to, would would you would you be interested in giving us a small demo of your LLM client utility so people can just see how much fun it is to play around with? Okay, so. Um, here we go. I've got a terminal window here. I'm going to start mm -hmm. by... So um, if I type LLM, a poem about an otter. Oh, that's because I misspelled it. So this is the most basic version. You give it a prompt and it's written a poem about an otter. This is using GPT 3.5 by default because it's cheap. Um, but yep. it's, it worked. Um, if I type LLM logs... It'll show me the, I, I can see that that's been logged to a SQLite database. Um, and you can open up that SQLite database and data set and poke around it and so forth. But where it gets really and fun. And just is to when... be clear, what so to do this, someone, you all you need to do is pip install LLM and then put in your credentials for your open AI yeah. keys or what something, you right? Is you type pip x install LLM to install it. And then you do LLM um, keys which is a command for setting your your API keys. So I can say LLM keys set right. an AI, and you literally copy and paste an API key in here. And that's it, and you're done and configured, then it can start working. But the fun thing is the plugins. So if I run LLM plugins, it'll show me all of the plugins that I've installed, which is a lot of plugins, because I mess around with this a lot. Um, if I type LLM models, it'll show me the list of language models that are available for me to use. And they all come from different plugins. So like I've got a ton installed here. Those are all of the OpenAI ones. Um, GPT for all is, um, those are plugins that I can run on my own machine. So let's run Mistral wow. 7B Open Orca. And um, you can you can do dash M that and give it a, a prompt, or you can say LLM chat dash M, and that'll open up a sort of interactive chat just in your terminal, which is useful because then it doesn't have to load the model into memory each time. Oh. Well, it turns out I don't have that model installed, so it's downloading it. Um, in that case, I'll pick a different model, but we'll leave that one downloading the background. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, let's do... Oh, there we go. It says installed up at the top. I'll do Mistral 7. You just um, maximize your... Or, yeah, yeah. make your font a bit larger okay. as well. Great. So I'm just saying hi. 
But this, and this takes a little while the first time because it's loading the model weights into, into uh, there we go. That happened entirely. Bicycle. This is now my laptop writing a poem about us not on a bicycle, which is wildly impressive. I mean, the poem's always going to be terrible, but yeah. this is it. This is a language model running locally. And again, all of that ended up in my log. So I've got like, SQLite database with all of that stuff that's going on in it. Um, one of the really fun things that you can then start doing is that you can um, you can start writing little scripts. So mm. this is my favorite one. This is called HN Summary, and it's a little script where you give it an integer and it hits the Hacker News API to pull back all of the comments on the thread, and then it gives it to, at the moment, that's some um, GPT-4 Turbo. Summarize the themes of the ex ex opinions expressed here. Um, include direct quotations where appropriate. So now if we pull up a random hack and use thread, let's do this one here. I can go HN summary, that. And this will now read all of the comments on the hack and use thread, and it'll spit out a summary for me so I don't have to read them. Here we go. Theme one, skepticism mm. and technical clarifications. What this and um, the prompt here, the, the including quotations, I really like because it means that you get you. It's almost proof against hallucination. You know, if it's if it's yep. making stuff up, you can at least fact check it and make sure that the um the the quote's good. It's quite good. This got like, B Macho and Wangasu raised concerns about this. Um, this person highlighted the community skepticism. This is kind of great, and I, I like hack and use threads can get pretty long, but now I've got a command I can run that summarizes them and as you saw the software the entirety of that software is what a dozen lines of of, um, of bash that's the whole thing so that i feel really illustrates why the unix philosophy and bagel pipe being able to pipe things into language models is so exciting this is what curl and then jq and then llm and that's it that's the whole thing and and now i've got a piece of software that does something really useful very cool and i, I love that we brought it back to the unix philosophy i also do want to mention that to your point of you don't have to write so much code um you and i both know and maybe many of the viewers do as well but there are things such as you know we don't know what code was used for chat gpt of course but like if you look at stuff like nano gpt the like that's several hundreds line lines of code right i'm actually going to put that in and anyone who doesn't listen to andre karpathy um start listening to him yesterday i i, I feel he's just such a wonderful educator among among other things i think so i actually used nano gpt and trained a model exclusively on text from my blog like because my blog's all oh, cool. so easy to pull out like all of my blog entries and then feed them in and i trained it for a while and i got it to the point where if you read this it's complete junk but it's definitely junk in this in my style like data set is a great idea about on the idea to worry about an end of a browser that can be used to build a django free draw it's quite good and this is a model, this, this, that, model, this is yeah. tuned, trained from scratch, just on text in my blog. So there was zero chance it would be able to do anything useful because it needs, yeah. you need like million tokens. A lot more, but yeah. As a way of sort of understanding a little bit more about how these things works, it's, it's kind of fun. Um, that's, and I, I love that it sounds like, and that's, I mean, chat GPT, of course, we know is fantastic along so many things, but the, the blandness of the prose is something which uh, it's, it's so boring sometimes. <laughs> right. So it's nice to see something that sounds like someone who's excited about things, actually. <laughs> in the H in an additional Python object of JavaScript and just a small server-side web server as well as web-based applications. This bit here, that's actually a sentence. That 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 yeah. whole almost. Yeah, it's um playing around with this stuff is just so much fun. This blog, by the way, so I've got two blogs that I run. Um there's my main blog, which is links and quotes and, and articles that I've written. And then the other thing is my TIL blog. This stands for Things I've Learned. And yeah. the idea with this is it's, what I love about Things I've Learned as a format is I don't have to be telling you anything new. Like I don't have to have some astounding insight to share about the world. I can just be like, yeah. hey, I figured out how to run ethernet over a coaxial cable. Or um, this is the trick yeah. I talked about earlier with the, um, where you use RG, to search for a code base, uh, search code for something, and then you pipe it to your system prompt. I love these. I check out maybe a couple of these a week, and I don't care if nobody else reads them ever. It's mainly mm. 
it might fit to my notes. And it's also so if I forget that I figured something out and Google for it in two years time, it'll drop me right back on, on, on a page that explains what's going on. Yeah. Amazing. Um, and also I do, I, I, I do love like your micro blogging style as well. Like you'll take s small things, put them up, move on to the next thing. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a wealth of, uh, valuable information. Oh, thanks. Um, so it, it's time to wrap up. Maybe stop sharing your screen once you've um, we've looked at the final final thing. Um, I just just wanted to pull up my LLMs tag. This is everything I've written about large language models, which is up to three hundred and sixty six things now. And some of these awesome. are a lot of them are links and quotes and just little bits of commentary. Very cool. Um, so everyone, I'd encourage you to to check that out. Just one second. I've lost Zoom somehow. Okay, I'm back. Um, definitely encourage you to check that out. I also think if you found Dataset or Simon's LLM Cly Utility interesting, please do play around with those. I'd encourage you to try to get stuff working on your laptop, on your cell phone, all of these things. Um, but as a final question, Simon, this is so cool. We still have... We've been going for an hour and a half and we still have 120 people here. So thank you all for sticking wow. around uh, as well. Um, wonderful stuff. I am interested what you'd encourage people to do as, as well. What would you like to see more people in the space um, be be playing around with? Okay. I mean, a really easy one. I want. I wish people would get, get into the habit of sharing your prompts, right? There's this thing where we're all trying to figure out this weird alien, alien technology that, that's just arrived. And... It's tricky because there's so much superstition involved. You know, people will say, hey, if you add, um, I will tip you $5,000 to the prompt, you'll, you'll get better results. And maybe you will, maybe you won't. It's, it's hard to be absolutely mm -hmm. sure. And that something I'm frustrated by is um, I want to do really good summarization of articles. And even that, I don't know, like, what's a good summarization prompt? I just showed you the one I'm using mm -hmm. where I'm like, pick out the right themes and, um, and that. But there's so much space for really robustly put together just prompt cookbooks, you know, I, I, things that I feel that we need. Um, if people want to do something really advanced, um, my LLM tool needs plugins for more models. Um, like every time a model comes out, I would love to have a plugin that means that you can start playing with it on the command line. I've got quite a detailed tutorial I wrote about how to write those kinds of plugins. But if you do want to do some like proper language model ner 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 nerdery and hacking, I feel like like plugins for that might be a really good thing to play with. And I don't know, I mean, I'd encourage people to sh just share what you're learning. Like there is, there is so much, like right now, we are still really early with the stuff. There is a good chance that you might dive into rag and find a new rag trick that nobody's figured out yet that, that yeah. gets results. And so the more people we've got banging on the edges of these things and figuring out what works and what doesn't, and then sharing what they discover, I, 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 I think mm. that's the point. All wonderful advice. I do. I have a question around sharing prompts, though, um, which is, I mean, I think the provocative way of stating it is that the product chat GPT doesn't exist in the sense that your mm. chat GPT and my chat GPT oh. may be different. And this is how software and products evolve now, right? And at any point in time, for me, it may be different. In the context of any conversation, it may be any different. So how do we even approach the idea that di the same prompt could have wildly different effects? This is the worst thing. The worst thing about this entire field is that nothing is um, nothing is repeatable. Like, I really want to write unit tests for my prompts, and I don't know how to because, because mm. the results are quite different each time. Um, so that's, I mean, that's a, a technical problem I'd love to see people solving just generally is there are lots of sort of big, large-scale evaluation frameworks. I want something I can run on my laptop where I can, it can help me answer the question, did putting output in Markdown in capital letters make a difference or not? And I still don't even have have that level of of, um, of sort of repeatability or, or, or confidence. So yeah, there's, there's so much around that, just personal tools for people to more sort of scientifically hack on these things would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think that's a wonderful note to end on and i'd love to thank everyone for joining everyone who's still here thanks for sticking around um but most importantly simon thank you so much for your time and expertise i enjoyed this conversation so much thanks this has been really fun thanks a lot for having me
Absolutely. And thank you all once again and see you at the next one. Cool. Okay. And...